Welcome, welcome, guys. Uh, Mike Pawnee here from Savvy Investor. We've got another YouTube live happening today. We've got a very great, exciting live training session ahead of you guys. Um, today, I'm very, very excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you can't tell, I've had about three cups of coffee just to get amped up for this session. And it's all about infinite banking today. And it's something that's being referenced. A lot of people are talking about this right now in this world called infinite banking. There's lots of struggles in regards to getting financing and all this wonderful stuff. And, and it's not great. But how about you guys being your own bank? Anybody else like to be their own bank? I know myself. That sounds like me. I'm, I'm a quite intrigued about it. So um, this has been a very hot topic as of late. Um, and I know for a lot of savvy investors, I've been getting a lot of messages and comments and feedback and very interested about this investment strategy. So with that being said, I thought I would bring out the big, big guns out today. Um, and we have Darren Mitchell and Christine Wyatt, uh, Christina Wyatt from Control and Compound to join us and share some of their amazing wisdom on this topic as we consider this as maybe part of our real estate investing strategy. I know for yourself, it's always interesting to learn something new, especially for us real estate investors. Um, so I thought, like I said, this would be a great discussion to kind of be had uh, with our savvy investor community. So as we are about to introduce our guest speakers, um, just as a friendly reminder, I can see your comments. I can see your emojis. I can see all that wonderful stuff. So please make sure that you share your questions, engage. I love engagement in all of our YouTube lives, as long as they're all positive, right? I only want nice comments, right? No, I'm just joking, guys. If you got negative stuff, it's okay. I'm a big, big boy too as well. So it's all about having a little bit of fun as we continue to learn. Um, so with that being said, if you haven't had an opportunity to do this as of yet, do us a small little favor. Please give us a subscribe as we try to build out and grow our YouTube channel. Um, so if you haven't done so, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So let's get to the topic at hand. And more importantly, let's welcome our wonderful guests, uh, Darren Mitchell and also Christina Wyatt from Control and Compound. Welcome, guys. And how are you guys doing today? Fantastic. Thanks for having us, Michael. Oh, it's great to have you guys. How are you doing, yeah, Christina? Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here and uh, be, be on this live with you guys. That's awesome. Great. Well, it's great to have you guys here. So maybe just to begin with, like, I know you guys are really active. I see Darren's face all over the place. I see Christina's face all over the place too. But for those that have been kind of are not aware of who you are, and I'll, we'll talk about what you do in a second, but more about yourselves, but maybe you can just share really quickly a little bit about who you are, what you do, maybe where you're from, if you don't mind, just giving the community a little bit of a sense of who Darren and Christina are. So Sure. So, uh, Darren Mitchell, I uh, I was uh, I live on the East Coast in Nova Scotia. Uh, I uh, have lived in a bunch of places across Canada, but uh, back in the East Coast now. Married, couple kids, and I've uh, been in the financial services business twenty five years plus. Wow. And uh, I specialize now, and our company specializes in nothing but infinite banking for real estate investors and business owners. Perfect. That's why we're here. That's good. A lot of real estate investors in our group, believe it or not. Yeah. So yeah. how about you, Christina? Uh, so my name is Christina Wyatt. I'm also on the East Coast. So live in Nova Scotia with my family. I have a husband, a 14 year old son. Uh, I've been in the financial planning industry for about 13 years or so now. Uh, but I come from our, our family uh, is our business owner. So uh, my husband owns a business. We've been in business and we specialize in we just recently got more into the real estate side, real estate investors as well. Um, and our business specializes in infinite banking for real estate investors and business owners. So no better people to talk to than uh, like-minded people, right? Which Perfect. is nice. <laughs> Perfect. Again, why you guys are here, our group is all real estate investors. And more importantly, I think people just have a, an inclining to wondering, what is this infinite banking thing? So maybe that's the very first question. How's that? Is, you know, maybe you can actually start to explain to all of our savvy investors, those that are watching it live. And thanks for jumping in live, guys. Uh, for those that are live, post where you guys are coming from again let's let's learn where you guys are from we got some individuals that our guests are from back east and so maybe share a little bit where you guys are calling from as well so let's start with the main question maybe you guys can explain what infinite banking is in really really simple terms for those who are absolutely brand spanking new to this concept sure so when we talk about infinite banking that's what we what we what i want to talk about first is you got to identify how you become wealthy. 
So I spent a lot of time and money through the years studying what wealthy people do. And wealthy people do three things they do exceptionally well. They invest in themselves. They join a real estate group. They get a coach. They get a mentor. They invest some money in, in themselves. You're the greatest investment you're ever going to make. So make yourself better. Get a coach. Take another course. Whatever it is. Then they start businesses and they invest in real estate. So once I figured out that that's how you become wealthy, then it was, well, where do you save or store your wealth before you do that? And that's how I came upon this infinite banking concept 15 years ago that changed my life. So oh, cool. basically the infinite banking concept is a concept. The product we use is actually a high cash value, um, dividend paying whole life insurance. Now, yeah. The idea is you got to save your money somewhere. We put it inside an insurance contract. It grows tax-free for the rest of our life. It never stops compounding. Then down the road, you want to do a real estate deal like Christine and I do. And we say, great, why don't we leave that money right in the policy, allow that to grow for a tax-free retirement. But I automatically, I can leverage 90% of that, no questions asked. So I call up mm. the insurance company and say, hey, I need a down payment. I need to do a private lend. I need to do a multifamily, whatever it is. I access money, no questions asked. The cool part for real estate investors, those are unstructured loans. You pay them back when you want, how you want, if you want. You don't give financials. You don't tell the insurance company what you're using it for. You just say, hey, I need 100 grand or 50 grand or a million, whatever the number is. You put it inside the, put it inside the real estate, use cash flow or some refinance to pay back the deal. Well, you effectively multiplied your money because your money continued to grow in the policy exactly the same whether you had a loan or not. And it's providing a death benefit to take care of those taxes so the properties can stay in the family. And it's being available or for, for the use in, in real estate immediately. So we try to multiply the money. We do that for the next 20 years and it just frees up us to take advantage of opportunities and deal with emergencies where you have ready access to cash whenever mm -hmm. the guy in the mirror says yes. Then I like that. At the end of it, we're going to take a tax-free retirement too, and we'll, we can talk about strategies on how to do that. Love it. I love it. Anything you want to add, Christina? No, Darren's pretty good at this. He can do it in 60 seconds or less. Like, what is infinite banking? We practiced it. So I knew he was going to handle that question pretty good. But yes, just like he said, it's a strategy um, that we use, that you learn, you utilize, and you just make everything so much better. We just combine and, it with whatever else you're doing. And it's interesting, Darren, you said you've been, you figured this out or you were learning about this about 15 years ago, because a lot of people, this, this is not a new concept. Like this has been around for a while. Um, and I guess that what's the reason why haven't people been hearing about this other than as of late, at least for myself, even, uh, you know, it's an interesting concept. So, you know, can you maybe share a little bit about how, how long it's been, you know, who's using this right now, what it's been used for and, and maybe other things other than real estate? Sure. Go Christina. Yeah, so uh, lots of people are using this. There's billions of dollars that go into whole life policies uh, every single year. So there's lots of people out there that are uh, using it. I think that maybe the reason some people haven't or people haven't heard about it so much is that the banks don't sell it. They don't like it. They don't want us mm. to be the bank so much. Um, so they can't sell it. So they're not uh, having, uh, uh, you know, uh, infinite banking end of the season, get your deposit in where we see that all online. Um, yeah. And you do have to take some time to learn about it. So yeah. I do find, you know, if you don't take the time to learn about it, you're not going to be able to utilize it. So a lot of people don't take the time. The reason yeah. we're finding more and more real estate investors are learning about it and utilizing it is because real estate investors take the time to learn new strategies, jump on YouTube lives, like go to conferences and learn more. Um, and then they're able to adapt to the concept and use it. But really, it, it has been used and utilized a very, very long time. There's lots of wealthy individuals that are out there using it. Um, every day. I think that, you know, social media and having things out there more is just making more and more people aware of it and wanting to learn more about it. Yeah. Awesome. The, really great stuff. And, you know, you made the comment, you know, the banks don't like talking about it is banks don't really like competition either. Right. I think that's, that's made the main, made probably the main reason. Right. So, but how does infinite banking like, and Darren, you kind of reference this a little bit as a, as, as a different strategy, a traditional versus traditional savings or an investment strategy. How does infinite banking differ from both of these different types of strategies like investments and savings? So, yeah. So, so, I mean, pe people typically save their money in one of two buckets, a short term bucket. They put it in cash in a bank earning zero. OK, they want it liquid. They want use of it. They want control of it. And then they put the other half or the long term money in an RRSP. And you think right. from a bank's perspective, you're 25 years old, you start an RRSP, 
you keep it there for the next 45 years until you turn 71. Then you turn it into a riff. You still keep it at the bank and they drip it back to you. They're in control of your money for the next 70 years. So right. if you accept that the way you're going to make money is investing in yourself, business in real estate, then you've got to be in control of your money. So, so really that's why we deal with so many real estate investors and business owners is they, they know the traditional way of, of investing is not going to work for them. The idea of locking up your money for the next 40 or 50 years in an RSP when you're an entrepreneur or a real estate investor and you need money to take advantage of opportunities just, just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. So it's funny, the wealthier the person is and the more successful, they already come to us knowing the traditional way isn't for them because that's how they became wealthy. They didn't follow the herd. They did something different. They started a business. They invested in real estate. So that's why we love dealing with those people too. They know the traditional financial planning where you lock your money away and you don't have access to it. Entrepreneurs. Yeah. And especially in this day and age, really financing is really, really tough right now. It's it's becoming more and more of an, of an issue. I hear this constantly. And again, this is just about being creative in a different approach in a different way, right? So maybe guys, really great stuff. I, I love what I'm hearing. Again, for those that have got questions on the Savvy Investor YouTube channel as well, I can see your comments. Don't be afraid to uh, share some, some of your questions. We'll make sure that our guests are going to be able to answer them on your behalf. But uh, we've kind of talked a little bit about what infinite banking is, but maybe you can kind of highlight or walk us through the process of setting up an infinite banking policy. So what are those essential steps? Keep it simple, stupid in regards to the whole process to, to make it easy for us to, to understand that, that process. Yeah, so I can uh, speak to that one. Um, the first step is really the education side. So learning the strategy, taking the time, picking up the book, listening to the podcast, uh, you know, sitting down with a wealth coach and uh, learning how exactly this works. So your very first step is learning side. Once you have the good basis of how it works, then we're going to want to build out a plan that's specific to you. So deciding on, you know, your deposits, your savings amount, um, what you want to put in this policy. So work together with an individual that specializes in this to make sure that they're setting it up correctly for you and, and based on your planning. Then what happens though, it, it's not your tradition, it's not like signing up for uh, an RSP or tax free savings account. There is a little bit more to it because of the fact that it's life insurance. So there is an application process that we go through. Um, and there is some underwriting we call where they ask some medical questions, maybe a little bit of financial questions. Um, and you're going to go through that as the process to set it up. Once you get the approval, you're good to go. You can start making your deposits and now your policy set up. So now it's on that compound growth curve. It's growing. You've got your funds going in there and now it's all about utilizing, right? It's all about knowing the strategy to go out, take those loans, make those bigger returns and having your money work in more than one place at one time, right? Great. Awesome stuff. So obviously the very first question is coming up is, um, it's a good one, actually. It's always the great what is the cost of a whole life insurance policy and how much does it grow per annum? Um, and how does it compare to kind of index S&P 500? You know, you got a bunch of investors here. They want to know down the dirt. What, what does that cost? Give me the numbers, right? So you got to yeah. love it. Um, and, and that's a great question. And, and, and we'll talk about it. But, but when we get that question, I know right immediately that person's thinking of this like an or asset, right? Do I do an RSP or do I hire a coach? Do I do real estate or do I start a business? This is an and asset. You're going to put your money inside this cash value life insurance policy. It's going to compound tax free and you're going to do real estate and you're going to do the S&P 500 and you're going to do that. Yeah. We're not for a second saying this is the greatest rate of return. It's going to compound the cash part four to five percent tax free long term. But the death benefit is going to be on top, going to grow even more. But this isn't where you make your greatest return. Your greatest return is when you put your money in here, then we multiply it. So the money's in the policy growing and doing the S&P 500 would be my first pick. I would prefer real estate uh, or a business or investment in yourself and a death benefit. So we're multiplying the money. So, you know, it's an and every other asset you have is an or asset. This is an and asset. You put it in here first and then we multiply the money, kind of like a bank mm -hmm. multiplies the money. When you deposit a hundred and they loan it out 10 times, same idea. Yeah. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Hopefully they got your that answers your question. Nice guy. I like the name. Nice guy. Very good. <laughs> I think we missed the cost one though. So the oh. cost of the yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't uh, know. Cost. Yes. Yeah. So like there's there's if, if you think of the, the insurance policy, what we're trying to do is we're trying to drive down the death benefit as small as possible 
and we're trying to maximize the cash value because that's what we can borrow 90% of and that's what we can spend tax free down the road, et cetera. So there, we don't look at it as a cost. It's, well, how much do you want to save a month or a year? So mm. I call it my opportunity fund slash emergency opportunity waste sex year. But your opportunity fund, people go, well, how much do I have to put into it? I'm like, well, nothing. But how big of an opportunity do you want to take advantage of? So if you want to build, you know, we have a lot of real estate investors that say, well, I want to buy another place in the next three years. This is how much money I'm going to need. Well, great. We can build a plan so you can have that money in there. And then when you go to do that deal in two or three years, your money stays in the policy. We just leverage 90% of it. So we multiply the money. So it really comes down to there's no, you know, 100 bucks a work, 100 bucks a month isn't going to work. We get lots, lots of policies that, you know, could be thousands of dollars a month, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. There's really right. no no minimum and maximum. It's how much you want to put in. Now, the minimum is, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month isn't going to change your life for a real estate deal. It'll take too long. Um, yeah. But it's we don't look at it as a cost. We look at it as how much do you want to save? Love it. Love it. Great answers. Thank you. And I hope that answers your question. Nice guy. That was a, a very good question. Um, and again, guys, post your questions. I see a few of them and I'll get to those questions accordingly. So, you know, you talked about some of the benefits and specifically for real estate investors, but maybe you can kind of walk us through Darren or Christina. How does this work for real estate investors? So again, you know, when you're acquiring a property, maybe you can kind of highlight the steps that would go through in regards to getting that capital out of that. So maybe you can, wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about how this does benefit in, uh, real estate investors? Sure. We can both answer that. Christina just, just recently did a beautiful uh, Airbnb with, with, part, part of, with part of the proceeds of a policy. Um, but like, here's a real simple, simple one. I did a private lend there a year and a half ago, lo lo loaned money out. I didn't use my money. I kept my money inside the policy. I called up the insurance company and said, hey, I need 100 grand of your money. And they said, Darren, we got two questions for you. Do you want to check or do you want to deposit in your bank account? That was it. Put it in my bank account. I loan it out to a developer at 15%. Year later, $115,000 comes back to me. I give the insurance company back their 100 plus some interest of or five grand at the time. Pocketed the difference. That was an and asset. That didn't affect my thing. Same thing when you use it for down payments. Now, this is huge. When you borrow, I bought a fourplex recently or a couple of years ago. When I borrow from my policy against my policy, my policy doesn't change. I go to the bank and they go, where'd you get the money for the down payment? I said, I borrowed from my against my cash value. And they say, cool. We don't consider that a loan for borrowing capacity. So it didn't affect, effectively, I was borrowing for the down payment and borrowing for the mortgage, but they don't consider it a loan. So mm. it's real simple in real estate. And the same is, you know, what if things change? You're six months in and all of a sudden things go south. Well, you can stop those loan repayments or make no loan repayments or reborrow more money. And the cool part is while you're borrowing this money and using it, your policy is still growing. The cash value is still growing. So if in That's six great. or nine months you need more money, well, your policy would have grown over that time and you can access more money. So it's super convenient for real estate. Doesn't affect your doesn't affect your borrowing capa borrowing capacity. And Christina, you can jump on this one as well. Yeah. So I, I everything you said there, I think the flexibility is huge for real estate investors having those loans that you make the terms to. Like we're literally paying, we're making the the terms to the projects that we're working on, which is awesome. Um, one other big thing that I think is is really great is that a lot of for real estate investors, we're thinking a little bit short term when we want that next deal, we want that next project and not so much thinking about the retirement because we don't want to lock up our money all the way for retirement. We want to do what we're doing now. The nice part about this is it's doing both for us. So like Darren yeah. said, as I'm doing, you know, these real estate projects, my mom, my money's still growing inside the policy tax free. And when down the road, if I ever stop doing projects, I don't know if I will, but when I'm yeah. ready to start spending, <laughs> spending some money in retirement, um, now I've got a nice big pot of cash value that I can go reach into. I can start pulling out tax free. I can spend it as I want for my lifestyle. Um, I don't ever pay it back because my death benefits just going to turn around and pay that back when I die. So instead of it just being a short short term, um, a short term goal. It's a long term strategy, a short term strategy. It's a long term strategy too, without you having to compromise for it. You get to do both. Yeah. Like as a real estate investor, you're already making great returns. I know that this is just going to make them a little bit better because now we've got the rate of return inside the policy. We've got the death benefit. We've got those loans available to us that aren't going to impact, impact our debt ratios. It's just, it's just making it, Darren says it's like, um, chocolate and peanut butter like it just makes it that much better right the two together are just are just better 
I, I like chocolate and peanut butter for sure. Right? I am not going to deny it. Reese's <laughs> peanut butter cups. That's, I was going to say that, Reese's that's peanut butter cup better together. <laughs> you know who like doesn't like that? I love it for sure. Good. Sorry, you know, stole your line here. Pop, there's a couple of questions that have popped up here, guys, just for everybody. And, and part of it is obviously the policy, which is not a big surprise on the question. Um, so um, a great question here from Soothing Sounds of Relaxation. Man, you guys got some great names today. My goodness. Uh, and the first one is, uh, I have a universal life policy. Is that possible for this? And there's a second part to this question from uh, Soothing Sounds of Relaxation as well. But I'll get to this one first. So uh, universal policy, is that possible to do this? Oh, with a name like that, I feel bad with what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> I love that name. Uh, no, Universal Life doesn't really work for infinite banking. Uh, we need a participating whole life insurance contract. One of the reasons why, typically a Universal Life, it's 50% you can borrow against the value of the 50%. And typically that money is invested in something volatile. In other words, like a stock market or an index or a fund. Uh, mm -hmm. And if it is, that's why they're only loaning 50%. Cash value, life insurance, whole life, they loan 90%. Why? Right. Because in the whole life cash value, it's guaranteed not to drop. If you got 100 grand this year, you can't have less than 100 grand next year. It's guaranteed to go up and there's a 150 year track record of paying a dividend each and every year. UL, you got 100 this year, the market drops 40%, you got 60 next year. They're calling that loan. That's why they're only loaning you 50%. And there's typically really high fees in a universal life um, mm -hmm. product versus the four companies, the four specific products that we use are actually federally regulated. And the fees would be approximately 90% less than a universal life. Right. On, on average, everyone's slightly different. There you go. I hope that answers your question. So uh, see so the sounds of universal life. Universal life's a great product. If you just want death benefit, like there's nothing wrong with that product. It's just not designed to grow your cash value effectively. Like, like, uh, like, like the participating whole life. Love it. Love it. Very good. Great answer. Thank you for that. So one of the questions that I have for you too, is, is there specific financial goals? So as somebody's kind of preparing for this and, you know, Christina, you brought this up is, you know, get educated first and maybe work with a coach and again, this is a new concept for them and they just don't really understand it. And I guess if somebody's even open to idea to, to proceed with this, is there like specific financial goals or, or situations where, where infinite banking is particularly more advantageous or is very advantageous? I think anybody with a financial goal, it's going to be advantageous because this is your foundation, right? So when we set up these policies, this is the base that you have control of. This is where you're going to save your money and then you're going to go out and you're going to multiply it and put it into those financial goals. So right. instead of a lot of people will think I'm going to start with cash and I'm going to save it in cash. This is better than cash. Like we've got competitive rate of return. We got control of our money. We're multiplying it. So it's better than cash. You want to build out your base. So I think it's the perfect starting point for anybody, um, but it can be implemented at any time as well. Just because you've already started your fine and you've reached your financial goals doesn't mean that there's not a place for it um, as well. You go back and you build that, you know, you just build a stronger foundation for yourself. So really anybody with a financial goal, it is, it is, uh, it's important to start with the base and this could very well be the perfect base for you and what you want to do. Fantastic. Great answer. Love it. Very, very good. Now, just like anything, there's a lot of pop, like I'm hearing a lot of great stuff with this. This is like really exciting. Okay. But just like everything, there's like, oh, it's too good to be true. Is there any risks or potential drawbacks to infinite banking that, you know, needs to be mitigated? You know, I, I, we always like to talk about all the wonderful stuff, but we, let's understand both sides to this story. So everybody understands it too, is if there are any risks. So, yeah, uh, I, to be honest, I think the, the biggest risk is dealing with someone that doesn't specialize in this. Like th this is all we do. We deal in every province in Canada and we, we help real estate investors and business owners implement this. It's a very popular thing now, uh, popular and negative online, but it's very it's out there a lot. So yeah. every Tom, Dick and Harry is saying, oh, I can do that. Uh, and, you know, it's like, oh, I can do your RSPs. I can do your disability. I can do your group insurance. I can do your pension. Oh, you want infinite banking? Yeah, yeah I can do that, too. And the problem is the, the people end up thinking they have a good policy. It's set up incorrectly. It's set up to benefit the advisor, not, not the client. And then the advisor doesn't know how to use it. So again, mm. all our wealth coaches are real estate investors. So we're real estate investors. We know how to use it. So, 
you know, it can be the even if it was set up correctly, which 99% of the time isn't, it's then yeah. it's how do you use it? Because if you put it in place and you never use it, you're not going to get the same bang for your buck than if you put it in place and you have a coach that teaches you to use it. So that's probably the biggest biggest one. Uh, second one is, you know, it, it is something that you need to fund for a period of time. So it's not something you can put one payment in. The worst case scenario really is if, if you said, I'm going to pay for put deposit money for 10 years and then you quit after a year, that's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, we can structure it. So, you know, once you get into two years or so, then we build in these safety nets and you get all kinds of options. But I yeah. see a lot of policies just designed poorly from someone that doesn't specialize in this and it isn't a real estate investor. Like, you know, are you a real estate investor? You're going to go to your bank banker who's not a real estate investor, not a business owner and take advice from them when they say, oh, no, no, you shouldn't do this. Or yeah. you can take wealth, the advice of what wealthy people are doing. Love it. Great answer. Like, it's just like anybody on your investment team. And we've talked about this here, guys, on Savvy Investor, on YouTube, lots, is you want to work with individuals. I don't care what part or what aspect of your team. Today, we're talking about infinite banking. But when it comes to realtors, property management, I don't really care who it is. They need to be real estate investors. They need to understand the business. Like, they just if they just don't get it, they just don't get it. It's so difficult to try to explain it. But when you are working with somebody that has that intelligence and understands that business, it just makes your life so much easier. So, you know, Darren, I think you alluded to a few things, but I, and I think you've highlighted a lot of really great points because individuals is a key part. Like, it's it's really understanding um what their goals are like our real estate as real estate investors what are our goals you know so if they are selecting if they're trying to find somebody obviously control and compound is is the company that we brought on here purposely for real estate investors to share with real estate investors uh because they understand it um is there specific things that individuals should be looking for from an individual or a company before they hire them and is there an interview process that you would recommend what would you suggest because there are other companies, there are other people that do this, but how do you determine you find the right person no different than a realtor or property manager? Yeah, I think uh, there's definitely lots of things that you can, the very first thing is obviously working with someone that's like-minded, your real estate, you know, oh, uh, you want to be working with someone that's investing in real estate too, um, which is great, but you also want to make sure that they are, um, that they specialize in the strategy. So there is such thing as an infinite banking practitioner. So that's someone that specializes in the strategy has taken training down in the States with the Nelson Nash group that is kind of, you know, has done this from the very beginning. So that's one way to see it. Um, you know, ask the questions, reading the books, um, you know, knowing your stuff as well when you're talking to them. A big red flag, though, when you sit down and you're looking at, uh, we can use, okay, so first we've told you that you have to use participating whole life, right? So that's huge. If you're not using a participating whole life policy, walk away. <laughs> it's not infinite banking. Number two, it has to be high cash value. So if you sit down and there is just a minimum funding, a minimum amount that you're putting into that policy that is not structured correctly. There is a right. proper way to structure these for high cash value. And there's always going to be a minimum and a maximum. So immediately, if you're not seeing a participating whole life, you're not seeing those minimums and maximums, it's not structured in your favor. It's structured in the advisor's favor. So you you, you want to walk away from that as quickly as possible. It's just a Great. couple of red flags to share. Those are great red flags. And those are some of the concerns that we tend to see out there in social. Like I see it a lot just, just in the media. Right. So, yeah. Good. Anything else you want to include, Darren? Yeah. I just say, you know, like um, if you do want to learn about it, we we can talk later. But like I wrote a couple books on it. I wrote I wrote, literally wrote the book on infinite banking for real estate investors. And my first one, Be the Bank, both Amazon bestsellers. Christine and I have a podcast that comes out five times a month. So, if you listen to someone for long enough, you're going to figure out if they know their stuff or not. Right. That's so, so read, read their books, read their blogs. And, and other guys have books and blogs and, and podcasts too. Like I'm not just, just saying us, but you know, you want someone that's out there saying, this is what we do. Um, because if you've done it a million times, like we have, you get pretty good at it. Uh, and again, back to that, we're real estate investors, but yeah, there's other good advisors in the country too. Love it. Perfect. And the reason why Control and Compound is here on Savvy Investor, because trust me, they wouldn't be here if we didn't have confidence in the individuals that are here. So there's some questions that popped up and some of them are actually repeats. So I might as well bring this up. So 
lovely Nadine Russell. It's good to see you here. Um, um, if I put a, so guys, get your calculators out, I guess. Maybe, I'm maybe not. I'm not sure. But I got a, I got a thousand bucks a month into a policy after two years. How much can you borrow against it? And, and what would that be? What would that look like maybe after five years? So I don't know if that's a more detailed question or if that's a relatively simple question. But it was a very, it's a similar one. It's how much money do I have to pay in to kind of get out? And so maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit if you don't mind. Sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume uh, Nadine is a 24 year old triathlete um, <laughs> who, who's in perfect health. And so, yeah, there's a lot of variables there, but in a nutshell, it, it's going to look like this year one, you're going to start, you're going to go underwater. And what I mean by underwater is if you put $12,000 in, you're going to have less than $12,000 of cash year two, you're going to like maybe 10, eight, nine, 10, somewhere in there. Year two, you're going to be a little better. You're going to put in 12. You might grow by 9, 10, 11. By year three, now you're growing by what you put in. And from there, it just starts going exponentially. So yeah. I look at it like kind of doing a renovation on a property. You're not getting rich year one. You're getting rich long term. So if I was, you know, somewhere slightly under the total deposit at, at the end of two years is what you could what you could borrow. So again, short term, if you need to buy a property next month, you don't want to put your money in an infinite banking or a high cash value life insurance policy today. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is, we're planning for months down the road and years down the road. Like, you know, typically one, two years is when people borrow it. We can put the money in and borrow it back in a month, but just if you do that, you're going to be able to borrow less than you deposited because you have that sort of hump to get through in year one. Perfect. I hope that answers your question, Nadine. And the way you described her, because I know Nadine was a 24-year-old and super health. That's ex you're you're talk you're explaining her directly, 100 percent right, Nadine? Right? Wink, wink, right? So anyway. <laughs> um, the other question that came up, which is also good, is um interest. So this is the question here. Do I have to pay interest every year on the loan? And maybe not the repayment, but uh just the interest component of that. No. So you pay it back when you want, how you want, and if you want to, is that that's the beauty of these unstructured loans. Um, the interest will, uh, the interest will accumulate, but you don't have to pay it. So in the early years though, for the long-term strategy to work, you do want to be repaying your loans, but we repay them based on the, um, we repay them based on the project that you're working on. So let's say you were doing a private lend, like uh, Darren had uh, said as an example, and you're getting getting the, uh, the principal and the interest back in a, in a year's time. Well, you wouldn't pay any principal or interest over that year because you know, you're getting the full amount back at the end of that year. When the private loan comes back, you turn around, you repay that interest, you pay, repay the principal, you pocket the difference. So you want to repay it for sure. Um, in the early years, but you can structure it exactly how you want to, and you do not need to make interest payments monthly or anything like that. It's completely up to you because it's unstructured. Perfect. Great answer. Very, very good. And there's another qu another question. You guys are hitting with the questions. And if you guys got them, post them. Here's your chance. This is for you guys. Ask your questions away. It saves me a little bit of work and then it puts it all on the gas, right? I'm just joking, of course. But here, here's the other question that, that's popped up is, can I transfer my group, my group life policy to a whole life, even my term policy, or do I need to start from scratch. So there you go. That's the question. Yeah, group insurance definitely no. That's not not a not a individual life insurance contract. That's part of your group. You leave your employer, you lose you lose your group. Personal disability or sorry, personal life insurance policy that's term depends upon which company you're with. So if you're with one of the companies that offer this participating whole life, there is a conversion that you're able to convert it to a participating whole life with no medical evidence. And that may or may not make sense. If you're still in good health, sometimes, you know, you may still need that term insurance because we're not going to really have a huge death benefit initially. So we'll, we'll go through the medical. But if there's a health concern and you have a term insurance contract, 100%, we can convert that to a whole life with no medical evidence. So it kind of, it's important when you're sleeve and selecting your term insurance that, that you deal with someone that knows which carriers they should be putting their putting putting the term with. In case you lose your insurability down the road, you always have the option to convert your term into that whole life when the, when the time fits. 
Love it. Love it. Great, great stuff. And hopefully that answers your questions, Pat. Um, like I said, great questions, guys. Thanks for sharing. This is your, your opportunity to ask. So please ask away. And for those that are even watching the recording, please type your questions in. We'll make sure that we get it to our guests to respond accordingly as well. So again, even if you're watching the recording, please write your questions down. This is all about you guys. So um, the taxes. Nobody likes taxes. I don't like taxes. But anyway, is there any tax implications or advantages for individuals that are using this strategy? Maybe you can highlight or share some of the you guys' feedback based on that. Sure, I'll go. So it grows tax-free, the loan structured rate are tax-free, the death benefits tax-free. That's it, tax-free. Um, and if you have a corporate-owned policy, some or all of the death benefit can flow through the corporation with those tax efficient corporate dollars flow through the corporation out to the family at death completely tax free. So there's an incredible tax advantages to it. Even if you buy a policy on one of your children where you own it, you pay it, you're the beneficiary. So they have no control and I can cancel it. I can take the money. I can borrow, go do real estate. But let's say, you know, my kids continue on a good path and at 25 or 30, I want to gift them that policy all that tax-free growth I had, that's tax-free when I transfer it to my child. So huge, huge tax implications. And that's what people ask us. Well, I see a lot of this stuff in the States. How does it work in Canada? I'm like, better. Mm. Because we, yeah. we pay higher taxes in Canada. So the amount of tax we save is higher compared to our American friends. Very good. Very good. So, you know, you're talking a lot about great stuff. And I don't, one of the things I always love to hear is success stories or maybe real life examples of people, you know, you've been doing this for a while. Maybe you can share with our community just a little bit, you know, do you have a success story or a real, real life example? You know, Christine, it sounds like you, you're a real life example just recently, but is there examples that you can share so then people can kind of visualize how this worked, how it was implemented, implemented and what was the kind of success rate for, for something like this? Yeah, absolutely. So we use our policies regularly whenever we're doing anytime I'm doing anything um, investment related, going to use my policy for it. So just recently, uh, we finished our first uh, self build from the ground up. So uh, first time buying the lot, clearing it, all that fun stuff. Um, and by doing the self build, did have to do some of our own financing, right? So I used my policy um, to get to each of those draws. So I did not pay any principal or interest while we were doing this. Uh, did not have to ask, you know financing is not that fun. And if you get caught without money in between, that's even worse. The nice part about having a policy is that I decide um, when I'm going to get my money. Uh, I just ask for it, it gets deposited in the account. So I would have used it throughout the entire build. Once the build fin finished up, I paid back the entire loan with that final draw when I went and did my uh, mortgage. So uh, when we think about, you know, as a real estate investor, you always think about exit strategy. So when I'm doing my real estate investing planning, I just throw the policy loan in with the exit strategy when I go to repay it. So I would have used this in between time. And then I use a traditional mortgage um, at the end once I finish it up so I could free up my policy um, for the next bit that I was doing. So that was um, one of mine in particular. I do always like to tell people though, like we have success stories going back a very long time. Like if you look it up, Walt Disney actually used a policy loan from his um, high cash value life insurance policy to start Disneyland. So uh, there's success stories going very, very far back in time as well. Not just, not just us. Cool. Disneyland. They're pretty successful, I think. Right. That's right. Kind of I know. Right? I like yeah. throwing that in there. Right. Yeah, that's kind of good. <laughs> good. Good. Awesome. Darren, anything on your end? I'm not sure if you want to share any other stories, but there's some yeah, good stuff. Like it, it's, it's cool. We've had like literally they call it infinite banking for a reason. The possibilities are infinite. What you can use it for. And we get a ton of real estate people that will use it for private lending. We get a ton of real estate people use it for down payments, uh, flips, burrs, where, you know, you need more money or you're doing a flip and you need, you know, that, that, that financing to, to do the renovations is always tough. So we get a lot of people use it for that. But then some of the non-real estate ones, like we, we have farmers that use it, right? So like farmers will, will um, sell their cattle at the end, at, let's say in November, have a bunch of money, they fund their policy. And then they, in the spring, they, you know, get little, little cows and they start, you know, feeding them and all the expenses and then flow it from that. We've got that. We've got people that survived COVID with that. We had some restaurant owners that wasn't COVID really wasn't, uh, wasn't great to, um, and they were able to basically borrow against their cash value to, to, to just keep the lights on until 
COVID was over and they were able to, able to reopen. We've had chiropractors, physiotherapists use it for their practice. Like it's literally infinite what you can do. Um, but we like using it for opportunities. You can borrow it, borrow the cash and go to Vegas if you want. We don't like that. We'd rather you use it for opportunities slash emergencies. Yeah. Very good. Good advice, too. And that's just no, no different than your line of credit in a lot of ways. You know, you don't want to pull your line of credit, go to Vegas and do all that wonderful stuff. As much as as fun as that really is, it's probably not the best financial advice um, that you should be taking advantage of. So um, real quickly here, uh, just bear with me here. So I got another question that just popped up and it's specifically to do with um, if you are uh, I'm not I'm going to answer that one just yet. But the question is, um, can I use my RSPs, TFSAs to, fu to fund some of this policy or is it cash? Maybe you could just highlight um, highlight that question that's just popped up from Pat here. Uh, so can I use the RSPs and TFSAs to fund the policy? So you can, you can use um, any of those things to fund the policy. Uh, the TFSA is fine if you uh, withdraw from a tax-free savings account. That's not going to be taxable, so that's not going to be an issue. The RRSPs, though, uh, they're going to get their tax money, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to use an RRSP to fund it, you still you you are going to have to withdraw from the RRSP, and that's going to become taxable income, so not ideal. So unfortunately, you can't just transfer it in and, and hope that they don't grab that tax because they are going to. Um, when you do that withdrawal. So yes, you can use it, but when you're taking from a taxable account, you have to be very careful about, you know, what that's going to do at tax time for you. Very good. Very good. Another question specifically to taxes. Um, it's just kind of the rumor bill that, that these types of policy loans are going to be taxable in the future. Um, any truth to that? Have you heard anything? So I, I, I have no fear of that whatsoever. So the government basically every 25 years reviews the insurance laws. Last time they did it was under Trudeau 2017. They changed, they changed, they just made some slight modifications. They actually made whole life slightly better. We were able to get more cash in in the early years. Uh, if you think of it, there's millions of insurance policies in Canada. CRA has no idea who has a policy because there's no reporting. It's not like your TFSA where they're tracking everything and then they're going to change their mind down the road. They don't track this. There's there, there's such a large it, insurance industry, is such a large employer in Canada. It's tough to go after that. Uh, it's tough to go after widows and orphans, which are typically who people talk about beneficiaries of these death benefits uh, mm -hmm. to go after that. And, and I say to people, are they going to stop mortgages? Like, it's really no different. If 10 years down the road, I got a million dollars of cash value where I got a million dollar property. I walk into the bank and I say, listen, I own this million dollar property. Will you loan me money? And they're going to say, yeah, I'll loan you money against an asset. And then the mm -hmm. next day I walk in and go, I got a million dollar cash value. Yeah, we'll loan you money against an asset. Now, it's actually a better asset than real estate because it's not volatile. And that's why right. they'll go up to 90% instead of 80% because it's guaranteed not to drop. So as long as they're going to be lending money against assets, we're going to be lending money against insurance policies. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Hopefully that answers your question as well. Soothing sounds of relaxation. Always a great name. Fantastic. Great name. Um, so one of the other questions that I've got for you guys is, you know, what what's the best way to maximize the growth and the flexibility of this infinite banking policy over time? What's... How do we maximize this out, get the most flexibility out of this? What's what's your best case scenario in this situation? Yeah, we actually maximize every policy. So every single policy. So basically the way we build a policy, it's not like, do you want half a million or a million dollars of death benefit? We don't we don't focus, start with that at all. We say, how much do you want to save a month or a year? You can pay monthly or annually. And once we have that number, then we're going to maximize that. So we minimize the death benefit, maximize the cash value and maximize the flexibility. So that's just a routine. Every single one of our policies is maximized. Perfect. Very, very good. And, and here's kind of another part to the question from Nadine. Um, if you are 50 or are, um, if you are 50, are you better taking out a policy on yourself or on your 24 year old son? Nadine, you just gave away your age. <laughs> anyway, <go on. laughs> uh, okay, so I'll answer uh, that one there. So you would think, um, mm -hmm. in theory, with life insurance, that it would be better, you know, cheaper premiums going with a younger individual, but not so much with these high cash value life insurance policies because we're maximizing them for cash value and not for the death benefit. Like Darren said, we're actually driving the death benefit um, down as low as we can. Um, so what happens is that you know.
know, age 50, your death benefit is just going to be smaller than what we'd have to put in place for your 25 year old son. And, and usually, uh, for, you know, especially at 50 is a great age, um, to put them in place, the cash values are better than what you'd see on a 25 year old, um, because we have to buy so much more death benefits. So the way we structure them is for the lowest death benefit possible. So if you're buying you know, if you want to put, let's say, $25,000 into a policy, uh, we need a certain level of death benefit. At age 50, your death benefit is going to be lower than what someone's going to need at age 25 based on CRA rule. So really, they almost um, even out. And it's always going to be better putting your policy for investments on yourself and from, for long-term estate planning. So we always recommend um, starting with yourself unless there is an issue with insurability. If, if you can't qualify for the, the policy, then we can look at using alternative insureds like your son where you could still be the owner um, and they'd be the insured policy on the policy for you so you'd be able to set it up but we'd always start with you first perfect very good whoops let me just open this up wrong thing there we go perfect Thank very good very 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 good um so with that being said i hopefully that answers your question and she was asking for a friend not herself just so you guys were all aware so oh. um you were talking about education guys um and you know what where what are the best places you got materials or resources what do you recommend for people that are wanting to learn more about infinite banking and, you know, you, you can go to YouTube, but there's a lot of stuff that's happening out there, but where do you get some of your best resources and educational material based on this? Yeah. So, you know, um, Nelson Nash wrote a book, becoming your own banker. Now it's, it's American, but it's very excellent book. Great book. Nelson was a wonderful man. I was fortunate enough to get to meet him. Um, then we have two of my books. Um, we have webinars too. We find a lot of people like webinars. So on controlandcompound.com, you can go and check out our, our webinars. We have one specific, specific for real estate and one generally on that. And that, that gets a lot of views. Um, podcasts, there's a couple of podcasts out there, Control and Compound being one of them. Christina, what else am I missing? Yeah, I think checking out the books, looking for the resources, the webinars, um, we do have them on Audible and whatnot as well, if you want to listen there. Another thing we're doing, especially for savvy investors, though, is we do have a front of the line meet with one of our wealth coaches to learn more. So it's an education session. If you're ready to take the next step, um, learn more about infinite banking, we're going to drop a link here um, below, but it's uh, controlandcompound.com slash savvy dash investor. If you go there, you can um, sign up and you're going to be able to meet with um, myself or one of the wealth coaches um, to learn more and ask your questions specifically. So if you're ready for that next step, um, we're ready to talk to you. There you go. I'm going to actually put it out in the chat just for everybody as well. And it's actually for those that are watching in the recording as well, you will see that um, in the link in the description as well. So you guys will be able to add, get access to that. Okay, perfect. Very, very good. Now there's another question that just popped up for clarification. I hope this is okay. I don't mind sharing this. Um, sorry, what I hear in the future is that the premium I put into the policy and what I can borrow as a loan could trigger a taxable gain on the difference. Uh, is true. that true? Yeah, that's a great, that, that, no, that's a great question. A hundred percent. They've all been good, but that was really good. Uh, yeah. So again, in a half hour tonight, we're not going to be able to talk about every single detail of everything that, that, that we do and what's involved, but yeah. So when, when you have a uh, cash value policy and you borrow against it, there's two types of loans. There's a policy loan and there's a bank loan. So the bank's like some of these internet banks, like some of the insurance companies have banks that they created just to loan against these cash value policies. If you do a policy loan, you could run into typically in year 15, 20 plus a situation where part of that loan is taxable and then you pay it back the next year and, and you get the, you get, you get the taxes back, right? So it's a wash, but we don't do that at all because none of our loans are ever taxable. We can, we can take up a, a separate loan through one of these, insurance company banks or or even the big banks um, and borrow against that cash value that way. And then we're not going to have any tax implications on the loan. So we kind of look after that in our end. None of our clients are paying tax on their loans. That's a key, key thing on why it's important to work with someone that knows what they're doing with these policies. Because if you don't, you know, we watch, we have our back office that watches and make sure that we get those set up um, whenever necessary. So it was a great question, but it can be averted. You don't need to pay tax. What we said was 
completely true. You just have to do it right. I don't like paying tax. So no, obviously that's neither. probably the best advice that you can get <laughs> is talk to the right people. Nobody likes fat taxes, especially in this day and age, right? So, okay. So guys, we're kind of coming up to the top of the hour and, and great questions, guys. Well done. Very, very good. Um, maybe just final last bits of advice, practical tips for our, our viewers who are maybe interested in getting started with infinite banking. And I am going to touch on both of you two. Okay. I want some different answers, maybe, maybe different answers, but you know, if they're considering this, you know, you highlighted what they should be doing, but just again, maybe to reinforce some actionable items that they should be taking if this is something that they want to proceed with. So. Yeah. My, my thing is invest in yourself. Okay. This is like anything else. If you want to learn this, you need to invest some time. So read a book, listen to podcasts, watch the webinar, invest in yourself, and then, you know, talk to someone. We've it's a complimentary education session. If you don't like it after an hour, you learn something, you move on, but just take action. People, I, I, I used to, I used to be the same way. Now I go to a real estate conference and I'm signing up for stuff left and right. And, and, and now I have a bunch of real estate, you know, Surprise, you sign up for stuff and then you actually do it. So just take action would be the take action to learn about it, whichever way you want, whether it's books, whether it's videos, whether it was webinars or whether it's podcasts or audio books. There's no excuse other than you need to invest the, invest the time to learn about it and deal with someone that knows what they're doing. Love it. Love it. Any other comments, Christina? Yeah, I say read Be the Bank. Darren's not going to pump himself up, but I will. Read Be the Bank. It's a great book to start with um, and, and to learn more. So if you haven't uh, picked it up yet, definitely take a read. It, it's a great place to start. Um, Darren's really good at simplifying complicated things. So when you're reading it, it just it, it it's a it's a really good place to start if you want to learn more about infinite banking. Love it, love it. Great stuff, guys. Such amazing information. Like I said, I know. We've only had kind of an hour and I know we could probably talk about this all night long, lots of questions and we might have to save you and book you guys for another, another segment of this. Um, and I know we've already touched um, where to kind of reach you and it's in the description, but maybe I can ask that again, if they do want to learn more about control and compound and education, where can they, what's the best place to, to see you, find you um, podcasts, all that wonderful stuff. Where's the, where's the best place to connect, kind of connect. So head over to our website, controlandcompound.com. There you're going to see links to the webinar, links to the books, um, links to our podcast. Our podcasts are on all of the, you know, the big platforms, the Spotify, Apple, uh, also on YouTube if you want to watch them really good spot to start as well. We're on social media at control and compound. So we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok, Facebook, you can really find us anywhere. So there's no excuse. I know you're on one of those platforms. Um, just <laughs> click follow. And uh, we are really well, we, we try really hard and make sure that we have new stuff coming out regularly, um, new tips, new advice, and, and we geared a lot towards real estate investors. So we're always trying to bring in real estate investing experts as well. Um, so that we're learning as well as you. Love it. And again, guys, they offered a free complimentary coaching session. So if this is something that you want to do, go to our description at the very bottom, click on the link that's referenced there. And it's also on the chat here, as you can see. Um, and like I said, they're offering that for those that want to inquire more, learn more, ask some questions. It's really about supporting you guys and seeing if this is the right fit for you or not, right? It's, it's important to just get an understanding to make sure it's the right fit. So Guys, I can't thank you guys enough. Great session. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, and, and I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to kind of share with our Savvy Investor community. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having Great us. Stuff. Perfect. So as we kind of wrap things up, um, I want to thank all of us that were able to join us live. I really, really appreciate that. Um, and at the same time, and I hope you found a lot of value associated with this. And before you leave, do me one small favor. Hit that subscribe button as we try to grow our Savvy Investor channel. And we'll keep you informed of any upcoming new videos and YouTube lives that we've got planned in the future. So with that being said, have a wonderful evening and we'll see you guys all at our next YouTube live. Cheers.